tells you the month, the date, and who, what king was in charge at that time. It will tell you all the details of what was going on. They'll tell you about the leaders that were in Jerusalem, as well as the king that was in Babylon. It was wrote in 6th century B.C., 600 years before the birth of Jesus. The author of the book was Haggai. The theme for this book is building the temple. Building the temple. Haggai means festivals. And like last week, we talked about festivals. Israel has a lot of festivals. They have celebrations for everything that goes on. Everything. They're great, fun people to be with because festivals are nice. Have you ever went to a festival? I took my wife to car uh, the, what is it, carnivals around here? Is it? Fair. Fairs. I took her to two of them this year. We usually didn't be up, was not able to go to them up north because it cost so much money. But since we ain't got kids now, we were able to go there and spend some time. And we had a really good time. I looked at the picture of it on the wall and I, I seen the festivals. Or, fairs. And I realize sometimes you just gotta have fun. And that's what's a good part about it is. So this is uh, one of the missions, ministries of Haggai. It says to rebuke the returning exiles from Babylon. And to and do not and tell them do not delay in rebuilding that temple. And we see that last week we were talking about how the people, some of the people are saying, now, we don't have to build the temple right away. Let's get our own homes together. Let's straighten up our own stuff to a point that they were taking the temple of God and putting it off to the side and saying, it's not that important right now. It's better that I live in a nice home. And we see that God told them and said that that was wrong, that he wanted, us, wanted them to build the temple. We look at one very important statement. And it says that the Lord says, I am with you. What a wonderful, wonderful thing is to know that God is with you. God is walking with you. God's presence is in the house. God's presence is in this building. I felt God's presence in my house last night as I was getting ready for this morning. It's wonderful knowing that God the God of all that created everything is with you. With you. And it's good to know that he's also there when you make decisions. It says this in chapter 1, verse 5, uh, let's see, verse 5, well, 14. It says, I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Gittai, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnants of the people. God stirred everybody up. He shook everybody up. The presence of God started touching people and changing people. And it says in this last part, it says, And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. The presence of the Holy Spirit was moving in their lives. Moving. That's what you want. When you come to a church, you want to see the presence of the Holy Spirit moving within the church. You don't want to go to a dead church. But you want to go somewhere that is alive. Something that is reaching people and touching people. It says in chapter 2, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. There's only two chapters. Haggai is one of the smallest books of the Bible. Two chapters. But what Israel started doing, they started putting work towards the temple, doing what God said. Remember last week I said the greatest thing God can give us is his presence, being with us, going with us everywhere we go, helping us make decisions, helping us to know his voice. Chapter 2, it goes into a little bit more detail. It says, notice the outcome of doing what the Lord says to do. Notice the outcome. Because prior to this, it was talking about you would work and work and you put money in your bags. 
your money back, but guess what? It wound up having holes in it. You're wondering, I'm trying my best to make sure things are taken care of in my family. My bills are paid, but it just doesn't seem like it's panning out. Seems like there's holes in my back. But now, but now, this is what it says in Haggai. Was I saying Hosea the whole time? No, okay, I'm just making sure. <laughs> in Haggai chapter 2, verses 15 through 18, God speaks of blessings, blessing his people. Now, yeah, now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, before they started rebuilding the temple of the Lord, remember what it was like. Remember what it was like before you started serving God. Before you started serving God. Before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? How were you? How was you doing? He's saying. Then one came to a heap of twelve measures. There were but only ten. They're coming to get whatever they need. And it was never measuring out to what they need. There was always less. When one came to the wine vat, vat to draw fifty measures, there were only twenty. I struck you struck you and all the produce of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail. Yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward. He's talking about what happened before. You never, it seems like you were not happy. You were not satisfied. There was something missing. There's constantly something missing. Consider from this day forward, from the 24th day, 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundations of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, consider this now. Is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed. Guess what? He's saying there is seed in the barn. How did they make money back then? They planted. And they sold what they're harvest was. That's how they did, took care of themselves. That's how they took care of the family. That's how they fed their family. It says, yes, indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranates, and the olive trees have all yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. How does he bless us? I remember when I was not even living for God. I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror. Things were just Man, I couldn't even take care of my own self. But now, since God did come into my life, things changed. Things changed. I started changing. My relationship with people started changing. I was not out there going to sit there and get whatever I can, however I can get it. But instead, I started treating people better. And people started reaching out to me differently. When I went to Bible, you know, I... Go a little back. When I went to church, after God spoke to me, I went to this church, and people started reaching out to me. And they, some, some of them wanted to hug me. I wasn't too sure about that. Some of them wanted to just shake my hand. But I started developing relationships and friendships. And I stopped running around all weekend with all my other friends that were doing wrong. But I started hanging out with my fellow Christian friends. My life started changing. Sometimes we need to make that change. Like what it said in chapter 1, they had to make a change. Because God said, make a change. Sam, you know, repentance is this way. You go on a train, you're heading one direction, and you realize you're on the wrong train. So what do you do? The very next stop, you get off that train, and you take the train that goes the opposite direction. That is repentance. And that's what God was telling them. Look, you're more worried about your own, 
homes, your all this stuff, but you're not worried about the house of God. You're not worried about what God tells you to do, but you're more worried about what you want to do. Isaiah, I want to read this in Isaiah. It's in chapter 66, verse 4. And it's part B, the second part of this passage. It says, when I spoke, they did not listen, but they did what was evil in my eyes and chose there that which I did not delight. When God spoke to us before, we didn't listen. We did whatever we wanted to do. But some of you in this room have changed. You have changed. You listen to what God tells you to do. And your lives have changed because of it. I remember when I got right with God, God was telling me to change. I was miserable when I didn't have God in my life because I was so miserable. I remember it. I couldn't. I didn't like myself. And I didn't like many other people. But when I changed and God said, turn, change, follow me, I started liking who I was. I started realizing that there is changes in my life that I didn't need make. And God helped me with those changes. Not everything was perfect. Not everything became perfect. But guess what? I had God with me. God was with me. So as Israel does what God has asked, they are blessed. You take care of the God takes care of the people and the leaders of the nation. How does he touch the leaders of the nation? God places every leadership leader in charge where they're at. You see that in Romans chapter 12. Every leader is placed there by God. You may not like them. My English is bad right there. You may not like the leader, but God has placed them there. But God directs our countries, and God directs leaders. Our leaders sometimes have a choice, follow God or not. But I do trust that God places and has the wisdom to do what he's doing with our leadership. God, God takes care of our needs. How does he take care of our needs? There's times I don't know how I'm going to pay the bills. And all of a sudden, God takes care of our needs. Sometimes, I don't know how I'm going to feed my, when I have kids. All my kids are grown. So they're running into the same situation. My daughter's wondering how she's going to take care of her kids. Because they're on a tight budget. They work at a church. And she had to go get another job. That's how God took care of some of those needs. See, with me, whenever I needed something, and it had to be a money, God has always applied, applied or given me a job to do it. And I would work for it. Sometimes a blessing is something we don't see as a blessing. Getting up 6 o'clock in the morning and going to work 5, 6 days out of the week. That's also a blessing from God. That you're able to work. And Deuteronomy says that we, all the money we make is because God makes it and allows us to make it. And he supplies our needs. If we look at chapter, uh, let's see, verse 23. In second, in Haggai chapter two, it says, "Well, this is a point about it. God will fight for us and be on our side." In verse twenty-three, it says, "On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant and son of Sheep, Shealtiel." declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. When we start doing what God tells us, He's going to open up doors. He's going to look favorable at things we're doing. And some of you guys say, well now, I'm having a hard times. 
But guess what? Without God, you won't be having so much of a harder time. I went through hard times, but I went to God, and I talked to him. And I realized that, that God I was talking to, which was Jesus, he loved me. And he led me through those hard times. I was out hunting one day, and I, I hunted late. I was out in the middle of the woods, and it got dark. And it became pitch black out there. No moon, no nothing. And I had to feel my way back to this road that led to where I could walk home. But I was a good mile in the woods. And I remember walking through the woods, feeling my way through. And I had to go down this one little big old hill. It's almost like a cliff. But I had to go, and go down that hill with no lights. And I had filled everything as I was going down, hanging on to trees, make sure I don't fall. And as I was sitting there and going down, I'm asking God for help because I'm getting scared. I didn't bring no flashlight. I didn't bring nothing like that. So I get to the bottom of the hill, start going up, and I hear somebody say, John! And I'm looking around and I recognize it's my dad's voice. My dad was calling me. He was looking for me. It's nighttime and I'm in the middle of the woods. He's making sure I'm not hurt. He yells out, John again! And I yell back. I yell back and I say, I'm here. My dad came and got me. I'm so happy about that situation. He came to the woods. He cared about me. And he came and got me. My God cares about you, wherever you're at. And he is calling and calling you right now. And he wants you to be his children, be his child. That's what he wants. Now, was that situation perfect? No, I still had to walk through the dark a little bit, but I knew my dad was really close by. It's just like when I stopped drinking. I didn't stop drinking instantly like that, but it took me time to start slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, to a finally when got to where I didn't drink no more. God's calling you today. God is calling you just the way you are. You don't have to change to come to God. You don't have to change. But what God is going to do, he's going to talk talking to you and changing you and changing your life as he talks. Remember the train? We're going down the wrong direction. Wrong direction of life sometimes. And God will say, get off the train and take the other one. Go the opposite direction. So, what Israel did, they heard God speak to them. God said, you need to get your priorities right, Israel. Get your priorities right. You're more concerned about everything away from the church than you are within the church or the temple. That's what he's referring to in this passage. But how can we, how would that relate to us? How would it relate? Sometimes we're more concerned about making money than we are spending time with one another, going to a Bible study, going to witness to a friend, inviting the church. Sometimes God just wants us to come and sit and talk to him. Some of the best times I ever had was sitting in front of the church at the altar, sitting in the presence of God and listening to what God had to say. Other times I'll be out fishing. And I would stop everything, and I'd put the pole down and just kind of sit where I could see if there's a back, and I'd spend the whole day talking to God. Israel was making the changes that God said. And God started blessing them. God started blessing them that they were saying that there was going to be enough wheat, enough seed for their harvest. Enough ways to take care of their family. There's not going to be that hole in your pocket no more. Or the pocket purse. You know how God took care of my pocket purse? He gave me a little bit more wisdom not to blow my money. Because guess what? I had to think, spend money and go a week without food. But he started saying, change, John. This is how you change. He started showing me. 
take home for us today. How is your life different since you served God? Since you asked Jesus to come into your heart, how has your life changed? My life has changed. My life has changed because guess what? When he told me to stop doing something, I stopped it. When he told me to do something, I did it. Last week we talked about Trace and I moving down here. We moved down here. We didn't have anything in our savings to go and bring us gifts down here. We didn't have anything like that. We were obedient to what God told us to do when we had to step out of our comfort zone. We had to step out of our comfort zone. And we had to trust God. But we heard the voice of God say, come. Come to South Carolina. Do you feel Jesus with you every day? There's some days, I'll be honest, some days I don't feel him like I did last night at my house. But I know he's with me. I know he's everywhere. And I know he's with me. And I know he's walking. And I know as I talk to him, he'll talk to me. And he'll touch my heart. Have you truly asked Jesus into your heart? These first two questions I asked, these are for Christians. These are for those that have already asked Jesus to come into their heart. But my last question is, have you asked Jesus into your heart? Because what Jesus wants to do, he wants to come in. See, I don't have to take a shower. I don't have to get cleaned up to go to church and meet Jesus. What he wants me to come in is just as I am. You ever heard that song, Just As I Am? You don't have to get cleaned up to talk to Jesus. You just start talking to him. I worked at the shelter. I remember preaching every Friday. And I told the men, you don't have to make everything perfect to come to God. But some of these guys would say, that, but first I've got to get this taken care of. I've got to get this taken care of. No, you don't. God just wants you just the way you are. Sick. Healthy. In sin, out of sin, he wants you just the way you are. And you know what? He's going to do the same thing to you that he did to me. He started saying, John, this is what my deal was. John, stop drinking so much. So I'd slow down. And I'd slow down. And I'd slow down. John, stop doing what you're doing. And I'll work on it. I'll work on it. And I, a lot of my addictions that I had, it took me a solid year to get rid of them. But guess what? I haven't had a drink of alcohol in 30 years. 30 years. I haven't smoked a cigarette in about the same amount of time. I started making the changes. He never hurt me. God never hurt me by making the changes. He made me a better man, a better father, a better husband, a better employee. He never hurt me. He didn't tell me everything was going to be easy. But what he said is he'll be with me. Change. I had to change. And guess what? So do you. Nobody here has met, met where there's no more change in life. You will be told by God to make changes. You will be. But remember, like I said, everything he told me to do never hurt me. Sometimes it was uncomfortable. I told a story about a man that uh, I sold him a, a vehicle, and he thought the truck that he had was part of the trade-in. And I know what the contract said. Because I wrote the contract down on And that was not the case. The next day, he comes in with his truck with his title and says, oh, this is my trade inherited. And, all, and they, that dealership happily takes that truck. Happily takes it. Because that's a three to $4,000 truck. They made a lot of money. And I stood up and said, no, we're not doing that. I'm calling that man. And they're trying to say, no, no, John, don't do it. And I said, look, you ain't got a choice in that one. I'm calling that man. And tell him that that was not part of the trade. You need to get your truck back. And they finally agreed with me. 
But listen, I'm not going to sit there and say everything's always going to be easy. You know, the easiest way would be dishonest. That would be four grand in my pocket, right? But no, I had to make a choice. I was going to be honest, and I was going to do the right thing. Even though people were mad at me, I was going to do the right thing. My friends didn't understand why I didn't run around drinking with them anymore. All my friends changed. I started having friends within the church. Because guess what? My other friends, oh, they'll just put it right under my nose at booze. They will sit there and try to get me to mess up as much as I can. They can. But I knew I had to change. I had to change. You may not see at this very moment what the change will do to your life. But I guarantee you that once you go to God and you make the changes that God says, it's not there to hurt you, but it's there to help you. So everybody, I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. This is a personal time. And I want to ask you to do a few things because God is really wanting to touch people here. God is really wanting to make some changes in people's lives. And yeah, some of the things he may tell you to do, you sit there and say, that's hard. You, got, you don't understand. But guess what? He does understand. But it's for your good. First thing I want to ask is Jesus in your life? And if you sit there and say yes, then I'm going to ask you this. Is he really Lord of your life? Or is it that you're trying to make it yourself God? Is Jesus truly in your life? If he is, he will tell you, tell you to change. It's not for your harm. It's for your good. If you're in this room and you do not have Jesus living in your life, if you don't feel him, if you don't sense him, if you have you just need Jesus, I'm going to ask that you raise your hand. Because this is something you really need to think about. You really need to think about this. You're not promised tomorrow. Too many times I have done a chapel service and people would walk out and by the next day, they're no longer alive. Too many times. This is really important because the change that God wants for you is not for your harm, but for your good. Jesus truly loves you. So if that's you, that you, I'm going to ask that you raise your hand. And as we're thinking about that, I know that God is speaking to people right now. And he's talking about some changes. And those changes are important to God. So important to God that he 